welcome you guys to Oikos, and as we say every single week, right? Oikos is our humble attempt to allow Jesus to carry us home, where we find rest and we're refreshed for the work ahead. And for future reference, you guys, we say this every week because no one knows the day or the hour I might call you up here to do the welcome for us and do the sentence. So saying it every week doesn't mean like, oh, it's time to check out and get back to the message when he finishes. No, it means let's remember what this is about because you never know when the day or the hour might come, he might call us up to come in and explain this. But I want to start tonight with the question, you guys. As I was, I was going through um, Revelation, it's, it's about to hit the fan from now on. It's just getting darker and worse from what we're going to read from now on. And so here's the thing. This is where it starts to get exciting for us. I like the events and looking and studying all the end time stuff. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, it's so cool. Look at this, look at that. It's also where you get entrapped a little because you stop looking at Messiah and you start looking at all these things. So as I was, I'm like praying and I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm reading commentaries and I'm listening to pastors and I'm trying to figure out how, how is this even applicable into our daily lives? How is this even relevant to us? You know, how do we make this more than just information we're dissecting? You know, how do we just, we take this from like, as we've been saying with, with, uh, in Genesis with Joseph, how do we take this from a word of knowledge to a word of wisdom? How do we apply that then to our lives? And so as I was just been praying about this and just clicking out all this, this question popped into my head and we're going to start with that tonight and that is what is this all about what's all this about you know what's the the point of us studying the book of revelation you know what's so important about us wanting to know what the book of revelation speaks to us you know why are you guys here you know what's what's the point of you guys taking time out of your ultra busy schedules because i know you guys are busy I know you guys have homework. I know you guys have school. I know you guys have work. I know you guys have a life. So you guys are juggling a bunch of things. Yet you take time every week out of your schedule to be here. Why? Why do you guys take every week time to be here? You know, and as believers, what's the point of your life as a believer? You know, what's the point of now you've said yes to Jesus, but now what? What happens with your dreams, your goals, your ambitions? You know, at the end of the day, what is this all about? Is essentially the question that I, I started to, to think about as, as I was going through this thing with the book of Revelation. And as we've been going through this book, we've been seeing that, yes, we are equipping ourselves, right? Yes, we are learning and we are seeing. And it's so interesting. And I was going to say it's so funny, but it's not funny. It's sad. We read things in this book and we read certain things where we're like, oh, well, yeah, well, well, that's probably a little bit far away. But then we start seeing things happening. You know, this like a couple of weeks ago, I think it was this week, you know, this idea of how Jesus says you're going to see all these false Christs come up, right? All these false Christs arise. And we start looking at that. We just look at social media. We look at the news and we start seeing all these false Christs come up, right? All these instead of Christ. All these people calling out people to be apostles, calling out people to love, calling out people on, like, this is what Jesus would want you to do. But we see that these are individuals that have no idea who Jesus is. So we start to see these warnings. So it's good that we're equipping ourselves because we're seeing the reality of who Jesus is in this book. You know, we were worshiping earlier and I'm back there and I got a, a text. And I'm like, oh, let me check. It might be like someone from the group or whatnot, right? So I check and it's those dumb spam counterfeits. It was like, hey, Sean, thanks for paying your AT&T bill. Click here for this prize that we have for you. And I'm just like, <sighs> but then it hit me. This is like the third message I get today about like, oh, you paid your bill. Click here for the prize, whatever. And the annoyance of the counterfeit. See, but the thing is, is that I know the difference from my AT&T text and this counterfeit. But if I didn't know the difference, then I'd be like, ooh, they're gonna give me something. Click on here for my prize. And that's what we've been doing with Revelation, right? We've been equipping ourselves to see Jesus. So when we see these counterfeits, when we hear these speeches that you listen to them, and you're like, wow, everything they're saying makes sense. You know, everything that they are saying, is, it makes sense. It's talking about love. It's talking about this. It's talking about Jesus. 
You know, they're using these biblical words. They're using these verses. Amen. Yes. Right? But when we know the reality of Messiah, we won't fall for the counterfeit. And that's the thing that we've been seeing. Another thing we've been seeing here that helps us with this question that I want us to think about this whole night is we're, we are seeing the reality of heaven. To so many of us, we're like, oh yeah, I believe in heaven. Oh yeah, I've given my life to Christ. And when I die, I'll go to heaven and I'll be with him. But we always picture heaven like this place, like this idea, or like just like fog and clouds everywhere. Like we don't have this concrete, like at the end of the day, it's a reality. It's something that we can hold. It's something that we can touch. But we've been seeing in the book of Revelation that that is what it is. We've been seeing that it's more than this concept or this idea, but heaven is a reality. And we see how in knowing that it also equips us and it helps us in our daily lives. It helps us in us moving forward and walking forward. But then when we look at the earth, we see things getting worse and worse and darker and darker. But see, here's the beauty in this once again, because we're studying this, because we're seeing his message, we say, yes, it's getting darker, but you know what though? God is still good. God is still on the throne. Despite what we see happening, we know that God is still on the throne. And how do we know that? Because he's telling us. He's telling us the end of the story. And so we hold on to that. And something that I really like that we did last week, and it gave me a lot of hope, was looking at the words of Jesus in Matthew 24 and looking at the progression of the book of Revelation we've been seeing. And we see how in Matthew 24, right, Jesus says there's going to be many false Christs that are going to arise. And like I said, we've been seeing that from the beginning. They've had that for the last 2,000 years. And actually, even before Jesus, they had false messiahs. And we see it now. Right? We see it from influencers on social media to governors and politicians. We see all these false messiahs that are coming up, that are quoting scripture, that are saying this, that are saying that. We see he goes on and he says, right, that's going to lead to wars, which is going to lead to famines, death, which is going to lead to martyrs of the church, which is going to lead to worldwide chaos. And eventually, though, the gospel is preached. Regardless of how downhill mankind is going, the gospel is being preached. And we see when we looked at Revelation, we saw just that, right? We saw that a white writer introduced, right? Not a Antichrist, but the Antichrist, the main guy. We see he gets introduced where it leads to what? Wars, famines, death with the other three writers. We see then it brings the martyrs in heaven, which then brings worldwide chaos we saw with the earthquake and all the, the sixth seal and everything that it entailed. But regardless of how it was going downhill, we still see what? The gospel preached. We see the 144,000 preaching. See, and that's the thing. The gospel is the why. The gospel is what answers that question that we're asking. Why you're here? Why you're sitting here? And the gospel answers why the book of Revelation. We see the gospel and we see why this. The book of Revelation, as I was looking at all these judgments that we're going to look at tonight, is basically looking at it through the goggles of the gospel is what we're seeing is we're seeing a God who wants the world to hear the gospel. We're seeing a God that wants the world to be saved. He doesn't want the world to fall into judgment. But we see the world chooses judgment. The world chooses to go in this path. But we see that's not what God wants. And we know that you... See, and that's the thing that when it comes to us being in this book, why we're even in this book. The reason we're in Revelation is because we want a deeper intimacy with Christ. This is the reason why we're not doing five reasons to overcome fear, you know, or, or what to do when I can't get a hold of myself. The reason we're not doing that and we're in this book is because we want a deeper intimacy. Because at the end of the day, that's the why for our lives. The why for our lives is deeper intimacy with Christ. It's being and knowing Him even more. And all our dreams, goals, ambitions should revolve around that. They should revolve around the gospel. Right? Jesus said, didn't he just say he commanded 
go and make disciples. And I'm not saying abandon your goals that missions your dreams. I'm not saying, oh, well, you know what? Angel sin, we gotta all be missionaries. We gotta all be preachers, you know? Forget my degree, forget this, forget, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, hey, you wanna be an architect? Be an architect that shines the light of Christ where you're at. You wanna be a nurse? <laughs> you wanna be a teacher? You wanna be a contractor? You be that and you shine the light of Christ. Pastors are not the only ones that are called to preach the gospel. All of us who say yes to God are the ones that are called because we see the gospel is the center of it all. You look at this book, right? This book is essentially the whole story of mankind from creation to the very end, right? And the new eternity with him. And you see, you get to the book and you're like on this page and we blow it. We blow it and it already in this already from here on, it starts to point to Jesus. It starts to point to the gospel. It starts to point to the Messiah. And we see Jesus faithfully. He comes, he restores us, he redeems us. And now from then on, what? All history looks back to that now. All history looks back to the cross. So we see the story of mankind. It goes back to the gospel. It goes back to that good news. That's essentially what that word means. Evangelion, gospel means good news. It was what the Romans would use when they would do a proclamation. Whenever the Caesar wanted to do a proclamation and a message, a soldier would get up on the stand and he'd be like, I bring good news from the king. And then they would give their proclamation. And that's essentially what the gospel is, the good news from the king of kings. And so that's what we're going to see tonight. That's what I want us to get, have in the back of our heads. Because it's about to get dark. Chronologically, we're at midway point. Midway point means that the Antichrist is not being a nice guy anymore. We see these are the last seven years of mankind, right? Inaugurated by the Antichrist, signing the treaty with Israel for seven years and ending with the return of Jesus Christ. Midway point though, Antichrist stops being the nice guy. Now he's like, I'm God, worship me or die. And we see he goes after the Jews. He goes after the Christians. And he pretty much is just like, hey, if you won't bend the knee, then off with your head is what we're going to see is what he starts doing. And we see that it's going to hit the fan. We see God's going to respond with judgment. And we're going to see that there's going to be demons released from hell, just doing just crazy, just tormenting mankind. And we're just going to see this downward spiral. But through it all, we see the love of God. And we see his gospel. So why don't we go ahead and we pray and get into our, our chapter tonight. So Lord, as we just come before you, we give you all thanks. We give you all praise, Lord God. We ask that you just continue to lead and guide us, Father in heaven. And we just ask that you reveal your heart to us, Lord God, tonight as we just read these judgments, Lord God. So many times we read Revelation and we just, we see these judgments and we picture this angry God. But we see that, that you are not an angry God. You are a God that loves us. So we ask that you just show us that you reveal that to us tonight. Holy Spirit, just open up our hearts and ears. Jesus, your brightest listening, speak to her. And we ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, we read the following, and it says, When the Lamb broke the seventh seal on the scroll, there was silence throughout heaven for about half an hour. I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and they were given seven trumpets. Then another angel with the gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. And a great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne, the smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. Then the angel filled with, in with the incense burner with the fire from the altar and threw it down upon the earth and thunder crashed, lightning flashed, and there was a terrible earthquake. So we're back in heaven and we see essentially three things happening, right? We see the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He's been opening these seals, right? He opens the final seventh seal and there's silence. We see that there's silence in heaven. When you start to realize what's going on here, it, it, it really trips you up, or at least it trips me up. And this is what I mean by that. Every time we've been seeing heaven right now, it feels like Jesus just coughs and everyone's like, glory be to the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. We see he, he opens a seal 
we worship, right? Or tribulation means worship, right? He comes up, they worship. He lays his hand as he prays on them, they worship. They keep worshiping the Lamb, and all heaven worships with them, we see. But then all of a sudden, here, he opens this world, this final seal, and there's silence. There's just silence, like, I don't know what they saw, I don't know what they're like. My, my first mentality goes to like, oh, I just hit the fan. Like, oh, it's gonna go down and it's not gonna be nice. Like, it's something so terrible that it makes heaven stop worshiping God for 30 minutes. Think about that. Heaven stops to worship God for 30 minutes. Actually, it's that. Eternity is a time, it's a place where there's no time, right? I gave poor Nemo a headache the other day when I was telling him, hey Nemo, if there's no time in eternity, does this mean that your grandkid, you and Paul, arrive at the same time to the gates? And he was like, oh man, why would you ask me that? But we see there's no time in eternity. Yet we're told for half an hour, there's silence. And so we see though, during this silence, what happens, we see that the seven trumpet judgments come forth. We see God is about to pour his judgment on this world that's rejected him. And so we see the silence in that. Because when you read throughout the whole testament, it's always called the terrible day of the Lord. It's never, it's never called the wonderful, amazing, happy, let's go and dance. Kumbaya, my Lord, day of the Lord. It's called the terrible day of the Lord. And it's called the terrible day of the Lord for a reason. And so we see that that's about to just go down. So everyone's in silence. But I do want to say this to us as we're looking at this. Our God is not a God who enjoys the death of the wicked. Our God does not go, oh, so you're going to do that? Well, I'm going to do this. Oh, oh, you laughed at my son on the cross? Cancer. Oh, yeah, you? AIDS. Our God is not that God. Our God is not us. That's us. Someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. You know, it is what it is. It's what we do. But our God is not that. On the contrary, we're reading Ezekiel 18.23. Look at the heart of our God. He says, Do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. God's heart is for man to be saved. But because he is God, because he is holy, he needs to act against evil, so he has to give a judgment. But we see as we're reading this and as we're at this part of the story, when we know this whole part of the story, we know that his heart is not to condemn mankind. On the contrary, because he knows that the judgment is coming. He knows what's about to happen. When you look at it with that mentality, when you look at it, oh, he knows what's about to happen. Now I see why he's so adamant about people getting saved. Now I see why he's so, oh no, I want you to turn from your ways. Now I see why he would come from heaven. He would come from heaven and die on the cross so that we wouldn't have to experience this. Now I see like, I see the severity of what's about to happen. We just read it there. He does not join the death of the wicked. Peter also tells us the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 19-11. He says, The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise. As some people think, no, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief, then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear, and fire and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Peter says it all right there. He's like, God doesn't want people to die. He wants them to repent so that they could be saved. Saved from what? From pretty much the destruction of the earth. He said, it's all going to go away. But God wants you to be spared from that. So we see our God. The second thing we see, though, is there's seven specific angels that stand before the Lord. And if you go back to the original language, it clearly says that these are specific angels. They're not random angels. There are seven specific angels 
that are standing before the Lord for this very time, for this very judgment. As I was going through commentaries and just going through different of the of the older like church fathers and whatnot, they all seem to believe that these are seven archangels that stand before the Lord. That word arch means chief. So there's the seven chief angels that stand before the Lord. If that's true, then we're counting Gabriel and Michael amongst these seven right here that are standing before the Lord ready to give this judgment. We see that they're given these trumpets, right? When you look at scriptures, what do trumpets do? If you go to Numbers 10, it gives us the purpose of a trumpet and it's, it's a fourfold purpose. The trumpets call the people together for prayer. They announce and give directions. They prepare the army for war and they announce special feast days. So we see that the trumpets, they have this idea of announcing and proclaiming and prepping for the war. So we see there's a proclamation then that's about to be made, is what we're being told here. And then we see the third thing that we see in heaven, and we see that right before they, they do their trumpet blast, there's another angel that comes. There's another angel that comes, and he comes to the altar, and he grabs a censer, and we see that he lifts up incense, and he lifts up the prayer of the people. But notice how then it says that he grabs fire from the altar and he throws it to the earth. And what is the reaction of the earth? It responds with an earthquake, thundering, and lightning. Pictures of judgment. And essentially what we're seeing happening here is we're seeing the proclamation is being made that God's anointed king is about to bring the judgment on the land. And that's what we see next. We see in verse 6 it says that the seven angels with the seven trumpets prepared to blow their mighty trumpet blasts. So these guys are about to do their judgments. These judgments are called the one-third judgments. They're gonna affect one-third of everything. We, we see that these four judgments we're gonna look at tonight, they're gonna come upon the life-supporting systems of mankind. They're gonna harm what helps man survive on this planet. And so we start to see here what God is essentially doing is He's cutting off the provision of man. Man's like, oh, well, I got enough to eat. I got all these crops. I got all this fish. I got all this water. I got all these things. Do I really need God in my life? And we see God starts to cut that off so that they can go back to him and live to him. That they may see him as Jehovah Jireh, their provider. So we see the first trumpet. The first guy comes up with this trumpet and he blows this trumpet and it says the first angel blew his trumpet. And hell and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. So we see there's this mighty storm and we're going to see that a lot of these judgments resemble Egypt's judgments. But there's this great storm with great hell. The air is now filled with ash because there's fire everywhere. And you guys remember the fires that we were having last year? When the sky was all orange and nasty and ugly and it just hurt to breathe. And especially if you have asthma and you have to go outside and, and like you're trying to breathe and then you see the ash just floating everywhere. Like imagine that, but like tenfold. It's the same, and not just that, but not only do you gotta watch out for the ash, you gotta watch out for the hell that's coming out here. You guys ever been in a hell storm? And it's crazy, like when we go to Mexico, they like, uh, they like to have like metal, like roofs like over balconies and it sounds like world war three whenever there's hell it's just like it's like the craziest thing ever but see here it says that it's hell mingled with fire with blood that it's coming down and it affects one third of the earth so one third of the forest the trees the grass the crops are gone and i was trying to do the math i'm like let's do the math because the number is going to go from like this to this at the end because it's one third. So what's one third of a hundred? 33.3%, right? So 33.3% of the land wiped out. So now we only have 66.6%, .6%, right? Now the next guy's gonna blow his trumpet with only 66.6%. .6%. We're not going back to that, we're only at 66. So then it says, then the second angel blew his trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all the things living in the sea died. And one third of all the ships on the seas were destroyed. So once again, we see the rule of one third. And the 
boy who likes to walk action movies in me is like, dude, that's crazy. That's so crazy. I love to see that. But the old man in me goes, nah, I'd rather have the security of heaven. I don't know about wanting to, wanting to be actually living that. But uh, look at this, what's going on now. It says this huge mountain, it's, it's thrown into the ocean. So this huge mountain can be either three things. It could be either a comet, a meteor, or a volcano that erupts in the middle of the ocean. Since it's a mountain of fire. And so think of the destruction that would come from this giant mountain of fire in the middle of the ocean, right? You got tsunamis, you got earthquakes, you got eruption, volcanic eruptions. If it's a meteor that hits deep enough to hit the earth, that make, makes the cost to react in that way. You know, when I was reading the, when I was reading one of the commentators and he was really set on, oh, this, this um, seems to be speaking of like an underground volcano that just like erupts out of the ground. My mind went to Pompeii and the destruction of Pompeii. And then it went to, um, we've gone to the Creation Museum in San Diego and they have an exhibit on Mount St. Helens. And it shows you how an eruption can just wipe out and destroy and completely change everything. And last night I was just going through the iPad just randomly on YouTube. And I don't know why, I don't know if it was God, I don't know why. You know how there's some like random videos for you to watch? There was this video that said, lava consumes pool. And I was like, I'm gonna look at that. That sounds crazy, especially because I was like on this volcano kick, right? So I was looking at it and oh, you could feel the heat just by looking at the video. It's like, there's these black rocks and then they would just fall off. And all of a sudden, like the bottom part of the rock was just like red. And then they started hitting the water and it just looked like boiling water. And it was someone with a drone like shooting. And it was like an, on an island that looked like it was an island where like rich people went to vacation. Cause it was a small island, but there was like a little like resort section. And that's where like the lava was hitting. But there was like this just pitch mountain of fire of like how it says there. And it was just eating and destroying everything. But look at this, it kills one third of, of the life in the oceans. One third of the fish is gone. One third of the ships gone. So there's a hundred ships in the ocean, 33 are gone. So if you got 33 ships, shipping ships with like, just to make the math easy, a hundred people in them, 300 people gone, dead. But remember the numbers were already diminished. We were at 66. So I don't know the numbers now, but we're probably closer to 40 now, 44%. So now we're at 44% of that 100 of the life that's been wiped out because of these judgments. And that's just two out of the seven and not even including the next seven. So then we see the third one. Then the third angel blew his trumpet and a great star fell from the sky burning like a torch. It fell on one third of the rivers and one of the, and on the springs of water, the name of the star was bitterness or wormwood. It made one third of the water bitter and many people died from drinking the bitter water. So we see the, the third judgment, this giant star falls from the sky that embitters the fresh water. So we see the progression. Your crops are gone, your fishing's gone, and your shipping is gone. And now your water's gone. We see now it takes away one third. It poisons one third of the people. Jonathan, my math guy, start calculating them numbers. So now one, one third of 44. Like 30? So we're down to 30 out of 100 that we started at. But we see, end up getting wiped away from this. Here's the interesting thing though, as I was like looking at the language and going back to all this, that word for star could actually mean two things. It could actually mean an actual star, like a meteor that falls, or it could mean an angel. It could mean an, an angel or a demon that comes named Wormwood that embitters this water and wormwood is a plant that actually grows heavily in the Middle East. That is just that it, it's a really bitter uh, plant. But we see though this thing essentially it just poisons, killing, again. So we see how God's not throwing punches. I mean, sorry, God's not holding back his punches anymore. God's like the time has come. It's the terrible great day of the Lord. And then we see our last judgment for the night. Then the fourth angel blew his trumpet and one third of the sun was struck and one third of the moon and one third of the stars and they became dark and one third of the day was dark and also one third of the night. 
So we see now he hits the sun, the moon, the stars, and it's just darkness. So we see it's all these things that sustain life on this earth. It's like they're slowly being just taken away. They're slowly like being burned away. And then I was just reading these things. It, it feels like genuinely like if Jesus is just doing this. Like you have the universe, right? And it's like, it just feels like Jesus is like, all right, this is what you wanted. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to take my hands off of you. See, because here's the thing. Science tells us that there's this thing called dark matter. So the universe is doing this, right? But there's something called dark matter that seems to be holding the universe. And scientists can't really figure out exactly what it is. And they've been trying to figure out what it is. And if you watch Big Bang Theory, Sheldon's been like working on it for like 12 years trying to figure out what it is. And he can't figure out what it is. And it's just like this dark matter. But you know what? The scriptures tell us that it's not a what it is. It's a who it is. The scriptures tell us that it's Jesus, the one that's holding everything together. Colossians 1, 15 to 17 says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. So we see that it, it seems like all he's simply doing is it's letting go. And we see that he has the authority to do that because he created it. It said that it was created by him for him. And it seems like he's just doing, he's like, this is what you wanted. So I'm giving you what you want. I'm giving you a glimpse of life without me. This is life without the mercy of God. Because the scripture tells us that he makes it rain on the just and the unjust because of his mercy. But we see here now, he's like, this is what you want and this is what I'm doing. And so we see that things are going to get really bad next week with these next two trumpets. To the point that God still in his mercy and his love, he sends one more messenger to warn people. And we see in the last verse for tonight, it says, Then I looked and I heard a single eagle crying loudly as if it flew through the air. Terror, 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 or if you have a, an older version, woe, woe, woe to all who belong to this world because of what God, of what will happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets. And what's going to happen when the last three angels blow their trumpets? Well, we know the seventh trumpet will usher in the seven bulls, and the next two is pretty much going to release these demons from hell that are going to come and torment mankind. So it's about, if, if we thought this was bad, it's about to get worse because now it's going from natural to supernatural on the attack on man and on what's happening. But look up even in that the mercy of God, he sends a mighty, a mighty eagle. Perhaps, you know, this is one of the seraphim we read, right? Remember those guys that have the eagle face? Maybe it's one of these angels, but he sends someone to warn mankind. Hey, you guys, it's going to get worse. You know, he's telling them, repent. You still have a chance to repent. And I don't, like, people are seeing this. We saw last week, heaven opened up and they saw God on the throne. And instead of repenting, they said, hide us from him. Hide us from God. But we see, regardless of it all, <coughs> the love of God is what we see. And as we wrap up tonight, as we, we close tonight's um, session, we see that as we look at these judgments, these aren't the judgments of an angry God. But on the contrary, we see the mercy of God. Yes, he has to render judgment because he is righteous. But look at who the judgment is on. The judgment is on the inhabitants of the earth. What that term means, the inhabitants of the earth, it's talking about those who would call earth their home. Those who would be of the things of the world. Those who would say, I would choose the world over choosing you. And that's why I said as we read these judgments, keep the gospel in the back of your mind. Because we see that God gives us a way out. He gives us a way out from this torment, from this judgment. He tells us to be sojourners, to not be of this world. We see Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.1, he says, 
For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself, not by human hands. And see, that's what we need to see, that God is the God of mercy and God is the God of love as we're reading these judgments and as we're seeing what's happening in Revelation. It all in circles, it all goes back to that gospel. It all goes back to Jesus Christ. It all goes back to his message. We all know the story, right? Adam and Eve sin. Adam and Eve go from saying, your will is done here, your kingdom is here, to saying our will be done, our kingdom come. And we see that is the mantra that the world lives by today. That is the mantra we saw the world living by last week, right? They see him on the throne and they still won't give up. They still say our will and they just rather hide from him. But we see though, regardless of it all though, in his love, regardless of us rejecting him in his love, he sent his son so that we can avoid this church. And we all know it, right? I tell you, the gospel and your mind goes to John 3.16. But it goes further than John 3.16. It goes into John 3.17 and John 3.18, 19, 20, 21. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and Nicodemus is like, so how do I get saved? Jesus didn't just go here. Here's a John 3.16 card. That's how you get saved. Just read this verse, believe it in your heart, and we're good. No, we see that he goes on and he tells them a little bit more. And so I love the context of John 3.16, because it tells us this is what it is. And he says, and, uh, continuing on, he says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son and the judgment is based on this fact god's light came into the world but people love the darkness more than the light for their actions were evil and all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for the fear of their sins will be exposed but those who do what is right come to the light so others can see what they are doing what god that they are doing what god wants and as, as we read the, the words of jesus it's like we're echoing what we just read in Revelation. The judgment, the judgment was already given. The judgment was given back in the garden when man chose to betray God. But we see though in his love, the son came not to judge, but to give life. Why? So that we can escape this. So that's why I started with the question and I asked you guys at the beginning, what is this all about? You know, what is Revelation all about? You know, what is the idea of Jesus Christ being the one true and only Messiah all about? Why is it so important for you to know that he is the only one true Messiah? Why are you here? You know, what are your ambitions, your goals? Why well, I asked, because it all encircles, it all goes back to the gospel. You're here because of the gospel. You're here because you reacted to the gospel. Someone gave you the gospel you reacted in faith, and now you want to know this Jesus deeper. Why? Because our God is the God of mercy, and our God is the God that is warning us of the judgment that we see here coming. So as, as we close tonight, that is the challenge for, to, for us this week, as we go out into the world. That is how we make what we saw and read today in Revelation applicable to our lives. Because when we really look at the scripture, how do you really make, you know, hell and thunder and mountains and demons and all these things applicable to your daily life. How do you do that? By sharing the gospel. By telling people, look, there's a judgment that's coming, but God's made another way. God's made a way for you to be able to be spared from what's about to come. And we see it out there. It's just getting darker and darker and darker and darker. I feel like when we started, like, just meeting with oikos and everything i would say that and it was like oh yeah you know it just went from this level to this level and like every couple months now it feels like it's every day it's just getting darker and darker and darker and darker so in that we're supposed to shine brighter and brighter and brighter what did jesus say when you believe in the sun 
you come to the light so that others can see your light and see that you are doing what pleases God. So that is the challenge for us today. When we see these judgments in Revelation, may we go and be that light to tell others so that they may be spared because we know that that is the heart of God. The heart of God is to spare mankind from what's coming. So why don't we go ahead and bow our heads and pray. So Father in heaven, Lord, as we just come before you, we give you all thanks. We give you praise, Lord God. We just acknowledge that you're Lord and that you just you love us, Lord, with the love we can understand, Lord. We're fickle at times. We hurt you at times. Yet you still love us, Lord. You're, you're still our God. You're still our King, Lord. And I just pray now for every individual that is in this room that I am, that's going to hear us online, Lord. I pray the prayer of Katie Joy that she said today when we were in that car, Lord. And I pray that we have the courage to go out and speak. Just like that man has that courage that we see all the time and everyone in this room knows who I'm talking about with this flag out there in the corner. And just proclaiming the kingdom of God and proclaiming Jesus Christ as Savior and calling us to repentance. I pray that we have that courage that go, we go out and we witness in your holy name. And we ask all this, Lord, continue to lead us, continue to guide us, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen.